And also in this country, I feel like every time you start to have a conversation about race, people go, what about class? And yeah. then you kind of go, 100%, absolutely. Mm. That is a really important conversation. And there's no doubt that the one of the things that is being let, le- left behind by representation is class in some way. Now, now, I would say, because of my political bias, that that is the result of, you know, 10 years of funding cuts. I, I, mm. You know, I've seen in the real world what those funding cuts do. Increased cost of living means that it's harder to exist and subsist, like, as an artist. It, it's, you know, I would say that there's economic factors for it, but I'm definitely, like, up for a conversation about class but what you then discover is very quickly people when they say working class they only mean white working class and um, they don't what's want to interesting consider to me is that as much as they consider it a rebuke to identity politics it's pure identity yeah politics. yeah absolutely yeah like my partner is white and he's working class he would never in a million years describe himself as white working class yeah because that is a definition which has emerged as a kind of way to delegitimize the language of anti-racism. Yeah. I mean, which is sprung up in that context. Yeah. Which is, you know, which is boringly is like, it's kind of necessary for a certain socioeconomic group to remain politically dominant. Right. The one thing Mm. that, the one thing that they have to continuously do is to smash any class race solidarity. They have to sort of make sure that the white working class believes its interests are in direct competition with all ethnic minorities. Mm. Because if those two groups that, you know, that's most people, (laughs) if if working class people and everyone from ethnic minorities starts voting as a block, then that is a really, that's a dangerous voting block potentially. Then the ruling class are fucked. Yeah. They're fucked. Yeah. That's because unfortunately that is most people. I don't want to talk about the class thing. So I think me and you've got like very similar educational backgrounds. I went to a grammar school for my sixth form. Mm-hmm. Then I went to UCL. You went to a grammar and then Durham. Yeah. And it seems to me like there is this sort of like you strata of like university educated, you know, South Asians with cultural capital who are occupying certain positions within the public eye. Mm-hmm. And then what's missing from that are people who didn't have that background with the emphasis on education you know it was a degree of of social mobility which was allowed because of the class background that your parents and your grandparents had before they came here yeah totally that that's like one of the most I feel like that's one of the most interesting things that isn't really discussed you know it's like what were the circumstances because we we've been very good and I say we I'm lumping all South Asians into one block here but one Mm. of the things we've been very good at is like very carefully inventing the Drake myth of started from the bottom. Now we're here. Like we very, <laughs> we very quickly been like, we came here with nothing. Don't ask any questions about what we were doing <laughs> before. Nothing, nothing. So why, why, why were you in Kenya? No yeah. reason. No why reason. Why were you guys in Kenya? Oh, no. Oh, oh uh, normal reasons. Normal reasons. <laughs> world of music. We were doing world of music. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No exploitation. Yeah, yeah. There. Yeah, we weren't a manufactured middle class that was inserted by the British into Kenya. No, we no. It was WOMAD. <laughs> it, was, yeah. it was WOMAD. <laughs> but like, I, I kind of feel like when we talk about, because you're having to defend some degree of representation against like the forces of reaction and you're right about that. I mean, sometimes we do reaffirm this myth of like, well, hang on, we're talking about people. We were middle class there. Yeah. And now we're becoming middle class here yeah. again after like a kind of generation of, of or two of, of interruption. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's definitely, um, yeah, I mean, listen, it's an interesting myth that we have told quite successfully. Um, you know, I, I saw the picture of uh, that Rishi Sunak posted uh, on oh my God, yeah. yesterday or the day before where he was like, you know, you know, how could I have imagined that I would... And I, so I was like, statistically, you could have imagined it quite easily, my friend. You went to Winchester. <laughs> you went to Winchester. You went to one of the most elite public schools in this country. And now you're telling me, oh, you know, there's no way I could have imagined myself being Chancellor of the Exchequer. Look at his primary school uniform. You don't have a primary school <laughs> uniform like that unless you expect to be in the cabinet one day. And like, uh, you know, 
in theory, in theory, stand-up comedy is a meritocracy. But in reality, the fact that I went to Durham University meant that there was already like a comedy organisation that went to mm. the Edinburgh Fringe every year and the university would part subsidise our trips to Edinburgh. And it was really like, particularly in Edinburgh, that I first had an idea that like this was something that I potentially could do for a career. But also it laid out in front of me what the vague shape of that career might take. And I was only really able to go there because of what university I went to. And I was only able mm. to go to what university I went to because of what school I went to. And you, you have to be careful. You have to really guard against telling the myth of yourself too potently, you know, or at least you need to have in the back of your mind a bit of self-awareness when you say things like, I made it on my own. You know, like, I, like, yeah, okay, 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 Mr. Grammar School, Durham University, you've made it on your own, <laughs> did you? You know, and, you know, that you definitely have to, like, guard against that sort of thing. And then, you know, it's like, wh- one of the things that I've, I'm have i so grateful for is that I got, you know, like, I, I'm, I'm really grateful for the fact that I started comedy at the time that I did and lots of the people that I met, are my dearest friends and but also you know I started at the same time as someone like Ramesh and he and I have Mm. been friends for that entire time and you know I really valued the fact that I you know you know when you can send each other text messages saying well someone thinks I'm you and I've just had a conversation (laughs) with them and not told them that that's not the case you know you can go back and and I have not corrected them because I also stole their wallet (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's like that, that thing I really valued. And then one of the things that I really valued was Nick S. Schuckler, who's a novelist and also a sort of like, I don't even know what the other title you would give him. is like cultural well, godfather. You would, he is an enabler. He yeah. is a shadowy background figure who is just very quietly supporting loads of artists and writers of colour yeah. to... He he, he, he is. And the thing is, he sort of pulled me because he knows people in comedy as well. We kind of met through that. And he sort of through this The Good Immigrant, which is a sort of book of essays that this thing is the Japanese edition of it, which is insane. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's the Japanese edition. But he through that book pulled me into this like other world of uh, people from uh, people of color from across a bunch of disciplines. And it's through Nikesh that I, you know, met people like Renny Edo Lodge and mm. Musarok Wonga and Vinay Patel and Inu Elams. Like I got brought into this like whole other world and it's it really shifted my perspective and watching the amount that Nikesh has done in terms of shifting the conversation about representation and has made me kind of go, it's not enough. If we are, if our sort of group of people, the kind of, uh, children of the upwardly mobile people who are middle class anyway and then mm. r- work to regain that status in a maximum two generations but in some cases even one generation mm. what is our responsibility then to the next gr- group of people you know if we if we kicked out if we had doors kicked open for us my first job in television was writing for the relaunched kumars at number 42 Oh, so wow. my first job in TV was writing for Sanjeev and Mira, who I, you know, grown up idolizing. So I feel like for me, the next conversations that I've got, I've got a responsibility to have are how, how do I make it so that somebody who is talented, but doesn't have my educational background or privilege, how did, how did they get the opportunities that I've got? 